welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicherian, former NFL scout and currently of Sports Info Solutions, joined as always by Aaron Schatz of Football Outsiders. Aaron, I saw you right on Twitter and you had me cracking up last week. You said, please take the third and long wide receiver screen and kill it with fire. Tell us how you really feel. I hate the third and long wide receiver screen. It is my least favorite play in the game. I actually ran some numbers on this a couple years ago that I should update, but at least the numbers that I ran a couple years ago, on third down with 8 to 15 yards to go, wide receiver screens converted only 16% of the time, running back screens 20%, and other pass plays 29%. Yeah, I looked at a similar statistic and I broke it down even more simply. On third and eight plus, teams average... 6.3 6.3 yards per attempt. That's less than eight. <laughs> so it, they're, they're clearly not getting there very much. And what'd you say, 20% of the time? It was not uh, 16% with a wide receiver screen, 20% with a running back screen. If, if I remember, I, I can't find the numbers that I did, but the draw play converted more often than the wide receiver screen. And the draw play is considered a give up. The fade route might be uh, getting a run for its money here. Obviously, you wouldn't run it in that situation, but. I think the fade route takes the cake as the most overall inefficient route that you can throw. Um, For this specific situation, though, I mean, uh, 16%? Ouch. Yeah, I mean, it's not just that the wide receiver screen is overall an inefficient route, which I believe that it is overall. It's that in that situation in particular, you're not going to convert very often. Like you're trying to get a, a, you know, you're trying to break a guy free for a lot of yards. And it happens occasionally. But it just doesn't happen that much. Wide receiver screen is mostly a play that you use to get like a moderate amount of yards. It's a play you can use like a running play. That, you know, usually you're going to get three to five yards off it. It's how you manipulate Jarvis Landry to make him look like he's a terrible receiver. When you need eight, yeah. <laughs> when you need eight to fifteen yards to go, getting three to five is a problem. Yeah, Jarvis Landry caught real passes in Week One. Unbelievable. A dot over ten yards, like. Just just a different guy, huh? Score score one for the idea that the problem with Jarvis Landry has always been that they were using him wrong, not that Jarvis Landry himself was not a good receiver. It's not about the Jarvis Landry. It's about how you use him. I've been telling my girlfriend that for years. Looking around the league, um, the Jets, um, I looked over at the DVOA rankings, and uh, of course the Jets are the best team in the NFL. And I also noticed that the Bills are historically bad. Can we expect to see more of that going forward? Uh, I would expect to see more of the Bills being bad than I would of the Jets being good. I mean, you never know. This could be a sign. Last year, the Rams were, of course, excellent in week one. They were number one coming out of week one. And that was a sign that they had turned things around. Uh, The year before, it was San Francisco that was number one after they beat the Rams 28-0 in week one. And that 49ers team won a grand total of one other game all season. So you do have to make sure you don't jump to too many conclusions after week one. But of course, we had Buffalo projected as the worst team in the league. So Buffalo coming out, they're not going to be this bad all year. But Buffalo coming out as the bottom team of week one is not a surprise. Not surprising at all. I'm very surprised that I'll be uh, in the Meadowlands on Sunday watching the 1-0 Jets take on the 1-0 Dolphins. And... It should be an interesting game. I'd I'd put my money on the Jets just just based on how good they looked the other night. But really, um, anything would be an overreaction. First of all, I'm not sure what there is to learn from the Miami-Tennessee game because I would have to think that having those two... 12 hours of breaks? (laughs) Delays, yeah, would really kind of set off everybody's timing. And they also, you know, played half that game against Tennessee's backup quarterback. But the Jets, I I felt a lot like what we were seeing was discombobulated Detroit more than we were seeing the Jets play great. Uh, I mean, I appreciated what Darnold was able to do in his first game. But um, on offense especially, I just felt like, and special teams, Detroit just seemed, it seemed much more like Detroit was discombobulated. So we'll, we'll see what the Jets can do against the Dolphins. But I certainly think the Dolphins have a good shot in that one, even on the road. Yeah, um, the Detroit looked super discombobulated. The only thing I can think of that's more discombobulated might be um, the the career that has been um, Bill's quarterback, Nathan Peterman. Nate Peterman, yeah. 
wow, just two two starts and just historically bad statistics for for Nathan Peterman. You almost feel bad. It'll be interesting to see. We're getting more Josh Allen now, and so we'll get a, a really early look at how everybody's favorite quarterback prospect is going to fare. Well, here's the problem: is he's not in a good position to succeed, even if he is better than what all of our statistics said he was. Right? I mean, e- even if you know Allen, it can be accurate. His receivers are not very good. They may not be able to get open. They may not be able to catch the ball on a regular basis. Uh, there's all kinds of problems with that offense. The offensive line has problems. They've got a couple of just journeymen in the middle of it. Uh, they got a new young young guy, I think, at left tackle. I, I guess he played about half the year last year, but I don't think Buffalo has really set up Allen to succeed early. Yeah, I, I, that goes without saying. Unfortunately for him, we don't really look back at Joey Harrington and say, Oh yeah, but look at the situation around him. It was, you know, he was bound to fail. Um, People are going to judge Josh Allen based on how he performs. And um, I'll say this, if he can do it, then, then we'll know something because uh, he couldn't, he couldn't outperform um, the guy that he's replacing. You know, it couldn't be easier to do that. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's, uh, silenced his detractors if he outperforms Peter Bitt because right, but if he can win if he can win games then, then the statistics will look kindly upon his uh, replacement level stuff yeah I don't know how many games he could win uh, they've got the Chargers this week and even without Joey Bosa the Chargers definitely look like the much better team no doubt about it um, okay let's look let's keep it on kind of the global look around the league a lot of talk going into the season the NFC is just so much better than the AFC right now uh, that's certainly my perspective on things. If I was if I was gambling on things this year, I'd probably bet on the Patriots, and then I'd bet on about eight teams in the NFC before I came back to the AFC. What does DVOA have to say after one week of football about that superiority? Are are, are we seeing that that the good teams seem to be in the NFC based on one week? Well, no, not based on one week. But what's interesting is there were a lot of AFC teams that dominated NFC teams. But in general, they were not the NFC teams that we see at the top, right? The, no one thought Detroit was one of those dominating NFC teams. So the Jets whipping up on Detroit doesn't seem like a statement about the NFC. Uh, Denver whipping up on Seattle. I don't think any of us had Seattle in the upper echelons of the NFC anymore. So the Jacksonville beating the Giants. I don't think any of us had the Giants in the upper echelon of the NFC. So for the most part, the teams we thought were in the upper echelon of the NFC played like teams that were in the upper echelon. The Rams, the Eagles, the Vikings, the Saints didn't against Tampa Bay. Uh, Well, half the Saints did. Their offense played awesome. Um, The Packers obviously had extenuating circumstances. But uh, it is a little surprise to look at DVOA and see like the Jets, super high up and Denver super high up from playing an NFC team. And then also a couple of AFC the teams that played AFC teams like Baltimore and Kansas city. Uh, I think within four or five weeks though, once we have some opponent adjustments in here and we get a little bit more data, I still think we're going to settle back to the idea that the NFC is dominant over the AFC this year. I'm with you too. Some of those results got me thinking that maybe the NFC is more kind of stratified right now than the AFC with uh, the real kind of, rich and poor teams, but um, I can't wait to see. What do we wait? After three weeks, we'll get the, the opponent adjustments in there? Yeah, we usually, after after uh, week four is when we start doing opponent adjustments. So we wait three weeks, and then after week four, we start doing opponent adjustments. And I think you're right about stratified, because I think what it might be is that the teams at the bottom of the NFC are maybe worse than we expected. Detroit, maybe worse than we expected. Uh, San Francisco may be worse than we expected. Arizona definitely seems to be worse than our projections expected. I mean, you know, we still had them, I think, with a top 10 defense. And after week one, they're 25th. Again, that's only one week, but it's not like Washington is known as this killer offense and Arizona couldn't stop them at all. You know, it's funny. I feel like we're so hyper aware of uh, overreaction Monday, kind of, that this week it seems to have been replaced by snap count Monday. And I feel like everybody early in the week was just, oh, how many snaps did he play? Trying to figure out, you know, their DFS lineups and things like that. And people, I think, I think we finally matured as a, as a football community where we don't look at this and actually, you know, jump to the conclusions that we might have in years past. Yeah, I think a lot of people are, are chilling out. Not everyone. Trey Wingo ran his top five of the week on, on the radio show, and he had Baltimore third and the Jets fifth and the Patriots not in the top five. 
that seems like a, an, a power rankings to me that overcorrects a little bit for week one. Yeah, I might uh, have a chat with uh, some of my friends over at ESPN about that one. I think you can get in some people's ears too, huh? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the the problem I have is the separation between TV and, and uh, internet is that they don't really talk to each other much. I think I've explained ESPN to people as, you know, the idea that the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. Uh, now imagine you're an octopus. <laughs> There's like a big separation at times between TV and radio and then between TV and internet and between internet and this part and this part and this part. So I don't know why, but the image of ESPN as an octopus just feels like, like if ESPN was an animal, I think it would be an octopus. They've got a lot of irons in the fire at one time. Yeah. And it's just, that's part of the Disney octopus. Yeah, that's too. Um, yeah, the uh, the stats and analytics team who who I mostly deal with over there, I don't think they would have much uh, to say about Trey's list either. Right, and that again, right, is like they they do all this work to produce total QBR live, and then it doesn't even get used on Monday Night Football. So there are definitely some disconnects. It's a very large company. Um, one more thing I wanted to talk about because we talked about it going in the helmet calls. Everybody was expecting that. We didn't see any penalties for people lowering their helmets. One. There was one on Ron Parker. For the ejection? Uh, he didn't get ejected, but it is listed in this. It is There is one penalty listed in the play-by-play -play as lowering of the helmet. Oh, interesting. Because um, we did see the ejection also. I think that was more of a, a unnecessary roughness type of, type of deal. But we did see this. A lot of roughing the passer calls in week one. I think we were all kind of on high alert for the helmet stuff. And maybe there, maybe people are understanding that rule. Maybe just the interpretation getting turned down is helping. But it seems like if you're a defensive player, you can't you can't avoid a roughing the passer call. You can't land with a fraction of your body weight. I understand not driving a quarterback into the ground. That's a bad thing. And I know we're going to react when Aaron Rodgers gets hurt, and he got hurt again this week. But it seems to me that it's becoming pretty impossible to play defense. And I'm one of these people that's. You know, as far as somebody that considers himself a football guy, I'm in favor of rule changes that are going to prolong the game and make it so that my kids can play. But um, these roughing the passer calls, I know it's, it looks out for the bottom line, but, you know, when the third down gets extended and they end up scoring a touchdown because of something that, that can't honestly be avoided, um, it doesn't it doesn't feel right to me. What do you make of all this? I think it's one of the reasons why scoring is up the last couple of years. Um, I don't understand the weight of the pass rusher thing either. Uh, they did come out after the week uh, weekend and say that the one on Miles Garrett in the Cleveland Pittsburgh game was apparently a mistake and should not have been called. But, you know, you're going to get those. I, I don't know what a pass rusher is supposed to do when he's tackling a quarterback to avoid putting his body weight on. He's trying hard enough as it is to avoid going low, right? Because you're trying to go high, but going high involves putting your body weight on. So I, I have no problem with trying to make the game safer. My problem is when the league seems to be trying to legislate against the laws of physics. Yeah, lowering your helmet's one thing, um, kind of questioning the, the landing on somebody to the extent that they are, I think it takes it a little bit too far. But uh, okay, we're on the same page about that. Let's take a quick look back around at the most important games from last week. Starting on Thursday night, we looked at the Eagles against the Falcons opening the week. What, did, what were your big takeaways from that game? My takeaway was that Nick Foles is very frustrating because, I mean, I don't mean just frustrating for Eagles fans. I mean frustrating for anybody who does stat projections because he was such a different guy in the regular season last year than he was in the playoffs. And then for the most part, he was back to being regular season Nick Foles in this game against Atlanta. Uh, he, he, they had about an average offense Philadelphia did, but Foles himself did not look like he was really doing very well. And they ended up for the week, sixth running and 23rd passing. The Eagles defense is phenomenal. I thought they did a great job against Atlanta. Notice that, uh, Calvin Ridley, I, I don't know if they threw to him at all, maybe once. Mm, good point. Uh, I mean, you can't stop Julio, but if you can stop everyone else, it's very hard for Julio to beat you by himself. Yeah. Um, I thought it was funny because we talked about this game and kind of half picked it and you informed me that I'd only get two and a half points for picking the Falcons. And I was starting to waver, 
we saw the line on this game start off close to six, um, and then it dropped to about even money. And then, of course, the Eagles covered by six anyway. Yeah, and 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 I think that that had to do with people being afraid of folds. There seemed to be a lot of like, oh, like a lot of the movement was after Wentz got ruled out and it was going to be folds. Right, and it, I, you know, justified fears, but then the Eagles pulled it out anyway. Um, it comp- it continues to boggle my mind how the the Eagles find ways to create value by just being more aggressive than other teams are. It's it's not you know it's a complicated code, but they've kind of unlocked it in a really simple way, and they've just said let's take where everybody else is at and move 5% more aggressive and just make that our baseline. Well, the Falcons tried to be aggressive. They went for it on a fourth and goal and they failed. It was the right call. It was the right, it was call. The right call, but they failed. Yeah. I thought both quarterbacks were, were pretty terrible in the game and our numbers bared that out. Um, in our new stat that we have called points earned, which takes the expected points added on every play and divides it amongst the 22 players on the field. Uh, Nick Foles was minus 10 and a half points earned. There were only six quarterbacks that performed worse last week. Um, only 30% positive plays for Nick Foles. So definitely would need to see some improvement there. I didn't really think, um, based on the eye test, that for the other side, Matt Ryan played very well. Um, the numbers come out a little bit better for him. Um, pulling it up right now, uh, Matt Ryan minus 6.7 points earned only 36% positive plays. So both guys struggled, I think we saw on Thursday night, and uh, it looked like a preseason game, as a lot of people noted. Yeah, and there's an element of that around the league um, where the first couple of weeks of the regular season sort of end up as the extended preseason. There's definitely, you get that feeling in New England because the Patriots tend to play worse in the early part of the regular season. So perhaps that extends to Philadelphia and Atlanta too. And there's something to be said for peaking later. Um you obviously don't want to give up games early, but but having your team peak later in the year as opposed to kind of peaking too soon um, is a reasonable strategy. Absolutely. Second game we looked at last week was Steelers and Browns, and we couldn't believe that this was one of the most important games for playoff probability, and they tied. However, the Steelers committed five turnovers in this game. It was a plus five turnover margin for the Browns. As you noted in your DVOA column, Pittsburgh had 5.9 yards per attempt versus Cleveland having just 3.8. We've got to ex- expect that the yards per attempt number is going to be more sticky than the turnovers, which are, are largely random chance, especially in terms of the fumbles. Um, DVOA seems to reflect that. Um, and really, I think um, many people come away from this game saying, oh, wow, they tied. Uh, people at first were saying, James Conner, who, uh, who's Le'Veon Bell? And then by the end of the game, the conversation's back to, well, if Le'Veon Bell was playing, what about all the things that the Steelers, you know, the Browns would have to play them differently and you get less double teams and things like that. I think what this tells us, looking at the yards per attempt, looking at the DVOA and the turnovers story, this really reflects that the Browns were lucky to tie. They were lucky to tie at home. We, we would expect on a neutral field that the Steelers would be a heavy favorite. Yeah, they recovered all four of the fumbles in the game, for one thing. And, I mean, I think this is... God, don't we see this every year? We don't expect to see it in week one, but every year Pittsburgh has that game where they go on the road and really play down to an inferior opponent. And that's what this game looked like, just the, the sloppiness. I don't know why that team, I don't know what it is, whether it's a coaching thing or what. It hurt the playoff odds. You know, we talked about that game and its importance for playoff odds. Both Pittsburgh and Cleveland's playoff odds dropped because of Baltimore and Cincinnati both winning. But we still have Pittsburgh, because their preseason projection was so good, we still have Pittsburgh as our favorite to win that division. And I think uh, kind of looking at things, uh, just taking a step back and taking the eye test, you'd have to think that the, they're the favorite. Um, I throw the Ravens into the mix there, uh, but the Bengals, the Bengals didn't look very good. And I don't think we're really thinking that the Browns are going to be competitive for the division crown. Yeah, the uh, ESPN FPI actually puts the Ravens ahead of the Steelers, which surprises me. God, that seems to indicate more overreaction to week one than I would expect, because I know that the quarterback is such an important part of their rating system, and the Pittsburgh quarterback is better than the Baltimore quarterback. So the fact that I think they have Baltimore third and Pittsburgh 10th really shocked me. In the, in the Dave ratings, which is our rating that combines week one with the projection, uh, we have Pittsburgh still number one and Baltimore seven. So, but you know, Baltimore moved up with their dominating destruction of Buffalo. 
But uh, ESPN's FPI having Baltimore higher than Pittsburgh by such an amount was a, a real shock to me. I'm with you there. I, I would probably still look at that the other way around, but I, but I wouldn't be shocked. Um, I'd be curious to think about what's going into that. Um, one interesting thing to note, uh, home road last year, Roethlisberger was the second best quarterback in the NFL in terms of points earned at home last year, 32.3 points earned, uh, 53% positive play percent. That totally flipped on its head when he was on the road. The positive play percent is down into the 40s and only about 10 points earned over the course of the whole year. So the the home road split, it definitely um, shows itself in Roethlisberger's stats, whether that's that's a product of him or a product of the team around him. Yeah, and that's one of those stats that is rarely consistent from year to year, but with Roethlisberger it is. Moving forward, the third game we looked at last week was Kansas City and the Chargers. Um, big takeaway here for me, uh, we were curious about Patrick Mahomes, and he looked good. Um, he had the second best IQR independent quarterback rating in week one, which takes the traditional quarterback rating formula and controls for drops, drops, interceptions, uh, throwaways, and things that are outside of the control of the quarterback. He was second in, at 142, only behind Ryan Fitzpatrick, Fitzmagic, first with 158.3 perfect rating. Mahomes was also sixth in points earned and 17th with a positive play percent of 46. So what does that tell us? That tells us he created a lot of big plays. He created a lot of points for his offense, but a positive play percentage of only 46%. We can look at that like we look at success rate, not uh, not the strongest rating there. So we saw high variance in his performance with a lot of really good plays uh, mixed in with um, some incompletions and things of that sort. Yeah, we actually had the Chargers come in number one in offensive DVOA for the week. They got killed by their defense and special teams. So the, what I took out of this game, other than a great performance from Mahomes and a great performance from Tyree Kill, was first of all, the Chargers going to miss Joey Bosa, and he better get healthy soon. The other is, why can't this team fix its special teams? Year after year after year, we go through this. Yeah, it seems uh, it seems apparent. It's a third of the game. We all we're all fully aware of it. Um, and year after year, it's a problem. And, and they seem to drop games as a result of it that that they end up needing when it comes time to figure out who's going to make the playoffs. I think to your point about the offense and, and how good it is, I think we can really look back at some of the statistics from 2017 and see some of the underlying statistics. Philip Rivers and Keenan Allen really had a good year. We're really good, really good last I mean, year. And you know, Keenan Allen. Uh, Talk about his his catch percent um, and some of the other the stats that go into it, the yards that he produced after the catch and after contact. Um, and these guys show really well in our rate stats. They had a really strong week one. Keep an eye out for that Chargers offense. I think we know that they're good. I don't know if we realize just how good they could be. The uh, I said last week we talked about this as a game that mattered for the playoffs, and it really did when you combine – uh, what it did to the ratings of these teams with just the winning a game in your division in week one. We went from having the Chargers go to the playoffs in about 41% of our simulations and Kansas City go to the playoffs in 35% to now Kansas City goes to the playoffs 50% and the Chargers are down to 26%. So last week made a huge difference in the AFC West. Denver also went way up. Oakland went way down. But really, it was the Kansas City and the Chargers because of that game taking place in the division. It was a really important win for Kansas City, even though it was only week one. All right. One week in the books and definitely you look at Kansas City and then you probably look second best team. You got to think the Broncos are right in that mix now. Um, really, really strong performance defensively. We'll have to see what they do when they're on the road and playing better teams than, you know, we don't know how good Seattle is this year. That's but true. Denver... There's been a lot of writing in these first last couple of weeks about Denver seems to have an extremely strong home field advantage early in the season for some reason. For I don't know why the altitude affects teams more early in the season than late in the season, but they have a habit of winning home openers at a really good rate. Interesting. All right, let's take a quick break to talk about draft. The Off the Charts Football Podcast is sponsored by Draft, the daily fantasy sports website. That allows you to enjoy the most fun part of fantasy sports, the draft, on any day of the year. With draft, you get all of the excitement of a snake draft with anyone from 2 to 12 participants, and then your players complete. That's it. No need for researching salaries, monitoring the waiver wire, or waiting the entire season to play out. With draft, you can participate in daily, weekly, or season-long contests. Draft is easy. The average drafts take under 10 minutes, and since you're competing with real people, draft gives you a better chance to win than many of the leading DFS websites. 
You can compete in any sport you want, and Draft offers easy, immediate cash payouts to all winners. Simply go to our special offer website at draft.com slash off the charts and sign up to receive a free entry. That's draft.com slash off the charts to claim your free entry. All right, Aaron, let's come back in and let's talk about the games that we're looking forward to this weekend. We just got off talking about the Chiefs and uh, Pat Mahomes. And one game that I'm definitely circling on my calendar is the Chiefs against the Steelers. What are you looking forward to in that game? Yeah, I think what's interesting here is uh, I looked back at numbers from last year. Steelers were a much better team against receivers out wide compared to receivers in the slot. So I'm curious if Kansas City is going to get Tyree Hill into the slot to take advantage of that. The other big thing is the Chiefs need to improve both preventing pressure and causing pressure. Last year, the Steelers were much better in pressure rate and adjusted sack rate on both sides of the ball than the Chiefs were. Yes, um, the Steelers definitely with all their zone blitz schemes, they generate a lot of different pressure looks, um, and that's huge. The big thing that stood out to me in week one is I took a look at Mahomes' throws and noticed um, in that game against the Chargers, they faced he faced almost all zone coverage. Um, they played zone, I think, on all but just a couple of snaps in that game. And in, St- in week one, the Steelers, likewise, they played a lot of zone, and their zone coverage allowed only five of 16 completions for 51 yards and an interception against Cleveland. So I'm looking at that matchup. How does Pat Mahomes fare against the zone in week two? Um, we saw, like we said before, some really big plays out of him. Huge credit to Tyreek Hill, obviously. But we also saw some incompletions. And I'm curious to see if kind of this this high-risk, high-reward strategy, how that fares against that, that Steelers zone coverage. We'll move forward. Packers and Vikings. Huge game this weekend, obviously, in the NFC North. Um, we expect Aaron Rodgers to play. Our injury specialist, John Veros, immediately uh, noted during the game that it looked like an MCL sprain grade one, and that looks like what it was. What are you looking forward to in this Packers Vikings contest? Yeah, is, is you'll have to excuse me for, I'm not sure if grade one means it's the more severe MCL sprain, or if that means the less severe MCL sprain. That's the less severe. Which is why, why he was able to come back and play on it. Right. John said he'd be able to come back in and hobble around and it'd probably bother him for a few weeks. Yeah, what matters here is interesting is what it means for him to hobble around, but it didn't seem to cause him any problems against the Bears. The Vikings are a different story. I think what what, what was remarkable is they sort of tired the Bears' defense out, so the Bears wasn't bringing, bringing pass pressure as much in the second half. I don't know if they can do that with the Vikings' defense, although the Vikings got rid of some of their depth. It was sort of a surprise when they cut Brian Robeson in the preseason. On the other side of the ball – uh, Green Bay, I think the we're really looking here at have they improved the secondary of last year. They were 32nd in the league against number one wide receiver last year, 26th against number two wide receivers, which is a really bad combination if you're going to play Stephon Diggs and uh, Adam Thielen. So I think seeing what their secondary does and Josh Jackson, who's the rookie cornerback, that people felt they were shocked that he lasted into the second round. I think seeing what he does in this game is going to be really important for the Packers going forward. Yeah, I noticed that they brought Tremont Williams back in. So maybe if he can learn something from the way he used to play his his man coverage out in Green Bay, that that would be good for the youngster's career. I was looking at this game and I couldn't help but but think about how we discussed last week that you said Brian Burke told you the NFL is a combination of a team sport and an individual sport. And I don't know if it's ever been more stark than in that game. Chicago has the team aspect down and green Bay seems to have the quarterback, the individual aspect down. Um, and I mean, Chicago's team aspect was so good that you hardly even noticed Akeem Hicks played one of the great games that, that you see defensive linemen play. And you hardly noticed him compared to what Khalil Mack was doing out there. Um, but at the end of the day, like you said, it's, it's part team sport and part individual sport and the individual sport is the quarterback part. And as good as Khalil Mack was Rodgers is the best spent money in football. He's he's we've said it a million times no matter how you look at it, you know, I get frustrated with quarterback stats because I haven't seen one that really captures how good Rodgers is um, in it, it, to a level that I think is appropriate, but really, really unbelievable. I think part of that is, is he's held back by his scheme. There's a lot of opinion out there that he's held back by his scheme. And I don't know how you filter that out. You can filter out opponent strength like DVOA does. 
You can filter out dropped passes and mistakes by receivers the way IQR does. Uh, you can try to filter out the other players on the field the way the points added stat does. I don't know how you filter out well, bad So schemes. It's interesting because my opinion is that next to the quarterback, the, co- the head coach is the most important player on the team, even though he's not a player. And maybe even more important than the quarterback in some situations. Um, so it seems to me that it's it's almost obvious from a, from a kind of just um, watching the game perspective how much of an impact the coach has on has on something. So maybe we really should be looking at the impact of the play calling um, and trying to tease that sort of thing out from from the actual results of the play. Um, we obviously haven't figured out what the what the magic bullet to s- sort this sort of thing out is, but but we have tinkered around with with coaching adjustments. Um, kind of in addition to your opponent adjustments, and that that might be reasonable. Well, there was the in um, the work that Scott Casbar did in the pre uh, preseason about DVOA on certain routes, right? Using the Sports Info Solutions data from last year on uh, which pass routes P, uh, guys had different stats on, and one of the things he found was that on some of the more positive stat routes in the NFL where Rodgers had really good numbers, but he barely ran those, like Green Bay barely ran those routes. And I'm, I'm trying to go back and see which which routes they were that we were, you know, that we were talking about here, how Rodgers tended to do really well, but he had really small numbers on them. Uh, I think post routes was one of them. Yeah, post we always find is one of the most efficient routes across the league. Uh, we only charted him with one comeback last year, and he had really good comeback numbers in 2016. And then in the half a season in 2017, he barely ran the, the comeback routes, which is the other one that he he doesn't really run seam. They don't really run seam routes. He didn't complete a single seam route last year, and they only ran five of them with him at quarterback. So there's this, you know, I don't know how you can like actually put that into a rating for Rodgers, but I think there's definitely stats that show that there just isn't enough variety in the Green Bay offensive scheme. And some of these routes that are really successful, like posts, like uh, seam routes and comebacks, that he just doesn't, they just don't put them in the offense for him to use. Right. And we see those routes, the 15 to 20 air yard type routes as being the most efficient um, across the league. And like you're saying, he's not throwing a lot of those. Um, just one more point on this kind of individual versus team um, conversation. One of the great uh, best quarterback versus best team matchups I can remember was in 2009 when the Saints beat the Colts in the Super Bowl. It was another perfect example of Peyton Manning just doing everything he could, kind of being as good an individual season as any quarterback has ever had. Um, and then on the other side, the Saints team that was really more of a, a well-rounded um, offense and defense playing together. And uh, fun fact about that, that was both Malcolm Jenkins and my rookie years together. Um, Malcolm Jenkins is still playing special teams as a Super Bowl champion, and I am doing neither. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, speaking of teams where this sort of the dichotomy between the team and the quarterback it matters brings us to the last really important game of this week because I can't think of a team where there's this feeling of the team being better than the quarterback more than the Jacksonville Jaguars. And of course, on the other side, you have one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time with Tom Brady. Yeah. It's, it's um, certainly makes always continue to wonder how the Jaguars didn't want to make that move for Teddy Bridgewater that uh, the saints swooped in there for. Um, We talked about it time and time again last year, the performance of Brady against different coverages and the variance that you see and how good he is against cover four and to a lesser extent cover three. And then on the Jaguars side of things, the Jaguars are going to play a ton of single high. They're going to play a ton of cover three. Um, And I remember breaking this down before the playoff game last year, and we noted, um, please stay away from that cover four against the, the Patriots. And on a big third down play, of course, there was a big open gap in, for a first down in that shallow coverage on the cover four where you only have three underneath defenders. And we, we uh, were talking about that the following week. I'm curious to see more of that this week. I'm looking at the Jaguars. I'm looking to see if they stay single high, if they play more man stuff, if they try to press the Patriots receivers 
um, or if they do sit back in that zone um, and how Brady responds to it. I will say the our, our sort of surprising projection for the Jaguars came out sort of half right in the first week. Uh, the defense was as stellar as it had ever been last year. And the idea that they were going to regress certainly didn't didn't seem to be the problem. And their run defense was really strong against the Giants, except for like one run. Saquon Barkley was really, you know, bottled up at the line. On the other hand... And that's going to be Saquon. That's what Saquon was in yeah, college. Yeah, and that's going to be that offensive line. On the other hand, uh, on offense, I think that the projection that there was, that the Jaguars were not going to go out and dominate the first quarter like they did in 2017, and that that was going to change how they played offense for the rest of the game, I think that also was borne out, that that offense was pretty weak. The Giants are not exactly a great defense, and that offense was pretty weak against them. So I think for the Patriots to win this game on the road, this is their defense needs to come out and, and prove that it's improved over last year, and that, that, that that'll be the big way for them to win this game on the road. All right, we'll look out for it. On that note, we will sign off. As a reminder, you can go to footballoutsiders.com, sign up for premium charting data, football outsiders projections Uh, if you're interested in an sis data hub subscription for the nfl or college football data you can get a free trial at sisdatahub.com catch aaron on twitter at at foa shots and football outsiders is at fb outsiders you can find sis at at sports info underscore sis and my personal twitter at matt mano and as a reminder, please subscribe, rate us. If you're enjoying the Off the Charts podcast, let us know and let us know how we can get better too. Have a great weekend and we'll talk to you next week.